Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Cabana Show, Body, Mind, and Soul. And we are live from Sfat on the 30th of 7, and it is Rosh Chodesh, the first day of Rosh Chodesh. We've got two days of Rosh Chodesh. Tomorrow will be the first of Tammuz, and in the year 5776, and we are the 6th of July on in the year 2016. And uh, this morning... Live from Sfat, together with Rabbi Lon Anava, uh, and we are going to be speaking a little bit um, more about the topic that we started last week. We were speaking about not, you know, how not to give up, not to, um, you know, how to go that that extra mile, how to s really save the world one person at a time, to reach out to one person at a time. And, and it seems like an impossible thing that one person can affect another or that it makes a dif we make a difference to a person's life. But the truth is every single one of us, every single person you meet, every single interaction that you have, every single rel relationship that you have, you are affecting the other person, and the other person is affecting you. And you can either really raise them, or you can do the opposite. That, you know, that's our free choice. And just in, uh, from the show last week, in terms of saving the world one person at a time, we're going to go that extra bit in talking about getting out of our comfort zone. And what does that mean, getting out of our comfort zone? So for, I suppose for everybody, the comfort zone is very, very different. Uh, it can be depending on one's time of life, your, the, you know, whether you're in the really spring of your life, the summer of your life, the autumn of your life, the, su the winter of your life. Your, your needs are different uh, and it, 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 it changes. And so... As I was researching for you know to do the show this morning, I was thinking that really it's one day at a time, it's one centimeter at a time, that whatever it is that you can do, whatever comes to mind that is positive, that is going to draw you in the direction that is going to build your life and that is going to build somebody else's life that is, that is in your life, that is going to make the difference. And it's, it's, you know, sometimes, you know, in this world with all the technology, one thinks it's fame and fortune and gaining as much physicality as possible. However, that's not what it, this world is about, as we've spoken many, many times. And it's about how are we are going to help one another, how are we going to love one another. And how we're going to emulate Hashem in, in his world. He begs us to emulate exactly what he does. To have mercy, to judge favorably, and to go that extra centimeter. And um, this morning, uh, Alon is going to be joining me just now. We live in Svat from his home. And I've been doing a lot of broadcasting from here, Baruch Hashem. It's the summer months here in Svat. And beautiful, absolutely beautiful and absolutely exquisite. And I'm so grateful to him and to his wife, Devorah, and their six children, the, the, the work that they are doing. And I say every single week to do yourself the biggest favor to go to his website, www.alonanava.com, or uh, you can email him, alonanava. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, at, uh, uh, at gmail.com and watch his his story, his journey about his near-death experience and all the questions and answers that he gives, his deep insight, his deep knowledge and uh, his journey of the last 15 years. And he made Aliyah about seven months ago. I made Aliyah, it's now three months. I'm here 90 days. It's uh, I made uh, Aliyah just after Nissan, on uh, Rosh Chodesh Nissan, and now it's Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. So, and it's been a journey of a lifetime. And uh, also, um, just to share with you, the SMS line 
anybody want to ask Alon or myself any questions about Alia? We've spoken a lot about Alia. We've spoken a lot about um, the coming of Mashiach. We are living in times of Mashiach. We really are. It doesn't look like it. It doesn't feel like it. It feels like we're at the end of our tether often and we're in, at the end of a rope. However, we really are living in miraculous times. It, uh, I definitely think it will be revealed very soon just how miraculously we actually are living, especially here in Israel. Last night I had the privilege to go to the screening of a documentary of, uh, called Above and Beyond about the start of the Israeli Air Force and how uh, so they took clips from 1947 of the ragged remnants of the Holocaust uh, coming to Israel, coming to try and and, and, and the, 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 the elections in the, in the United Nations, um, you know, for or against uh, bringing Israel into existence after 2,000 years. And then just watching and listening to these, these pilots that came from America, they, and they were, uh, uh, some of them were arrested because it was illegal. They, uh, some of them lost their citizenship because they volunteered as, as, as pilots, as fighter pilots. And they established, and the first raid that they sent was three airplanes and one got shot down. It was two airplanes, two little airplanes with one propeller, and they even shot off parts of the propeller. And they bombed the oncoming Egyptian army and the oncoming of Egyptian army that was about to enter Tel Aviv turned around and went back. It, it was just miraculous to actually watch that documentary last night. So a lot is together with me now. Thank good morning, you Dr. and Tom. good morning. And thank you so much, Alon, and thank you to your wife and to your children for every week, the, 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 the incredible sacrifice, and I'm just so grateful. So thank you so, so much. My pleasure. Uh, and uh, I was just saying to the listeners that um, we're going to be speaking about getting out of our comfort zone literally one centimetre at a time. That, that, that's all we need to do in everything that we do, in our tefillas, in our um, cooking, in, in, in every little thing that Hashem has given us to do, just to go that extra little bit. Yep. So... Okay, and um, I think we need to go to a, a quick break and then um, Alon is going to um, delve into the, the topic. From Johannesburg to Israel, to business, this is 101.9 High Good morning and welcome to the Kavana Show, Body, Mind and Soul. And... This morning I'm sitting together with Rabbi Lon Anava and um, we are talking about going that extra mile. Last week we spoke about saving the world one person at a time, one little bit at a time. And this morning is we're talking about getting out of the comfort zone that lulls us into this slumber of it, it, it can be pr practically a lifetime sometimes and suddenly something wakes you up. And then how to actually get out of that, because it, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge in this lifetime, because we're living in such darkness. So how do we get out of that, the, out of that comfort zone? Well, unfortunately, nothing is easy, especially when it comes for serving God, and nothing comes so easy and fast. And... You said it yourself that that when a person is stuck in their in a, in their comfort zone, first of all, there's a pro, there's a there's two problems here. There's the spiritual problem and there's the physical problem. The physical problem is that our sages give an example that a, a prisoner cannot be released from his own cell, and when a person is stuck in in a, in, in their own comfort zone, then they're not they cannot be released by themselves. Like a prisoner that is captured in a, in a cell, he cannot open the door to let himself out. 
The spiritual problem is that this comfort zone is, is a cover of the reality. And like I always go back to the original, when you want to solve a problem, you have to understand where it started. So as usual, it all started in the six days of creation when Adam and Eve were created. Because originally the world was created in a way that it did not have a spiritual cover. That everything was obvious and everything was clear. And Adam, Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, they were able to see godliness. They were able to see God. And whenever they made the sin, then they went down in their level. So there's many different explanations what exactly happened, because we know right after that that God dressed them. It, the, the Torah says in a very uh, literal way that He dressed them in leather garments, in kutnot o. But spiritually what it means is that He dressed them, first of all with a body, because in the beginning they were just souls, so they were able to see godliness. Or, see, or to more to be exact or literal, they saw the truth. There was no deceiving. Nothing was, was there to separate them from the reality. But not only they were dressed in bodies, the world was covered with some type of an energy that we call it klipa. Klipa is like a shell, like a, a, fu a, a fruit will have a shell, well, a fruit have a peel. Uh, maybe a hard boiled egg will have a shell. But we see in many different types of food that we eat that it has a cover. Usually the cover, whether it's a peel, a shell, it's not edible. It's just covering the, the, the actual fruit. So this spiritual power covered the reality of the truth. And, the, and the, real, the, the reaction from that is that now was created two realities. The reality that is called truth, which is the, the, the reality, and a reality that is called a lie, something that is deceiving. And this is a, in the Kabbalistic term, term what's called the secret of the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge is, is mixed between good and bad. That everything, the good and the bad, got mixed together. And it's very hard to, to say the difference, what's good or what's bad. You can take now two apples, and one of them is completely rotten inside, but the outside looks exactly the same, and you cannot tell the difference between the good and the bad. And in our reality, the bad is covered with good, the good is mixed with the bad, and one big mishmash. So, a couple thousand years later, God gave us a, 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 did for us a favor, and He gave us the Torah. The Torah is our manual. Torah comes from the word in Hebrew, Hora'ah, to teach. And in this manual, this thick book, besides interesting stories, is all the guide, guidance. How do I separate between good and bad? So the Torah came and made a lot of order, and he told me, this animal, for example, a cow, it's a kosher animal. That animal, for example, a camel, is not kosher. So he made my life easy. Instead of me going and starting to figuring out, so the Torah told me everything that I need to know, what's kosher, what's not kosher, what's pure, what is not pure, what is permitted, what is not permitted. Why? Because the world is mixed in this power that is called klipa. Now, there are different types of klipot. The klipa that I'm talking about is called klipat noga, that it's mixed good and bad. And uh, an, uh, an average person cannot know the difference what, what, between the good and the bad. And this is one of our main jobs for the last couple thousand years. This is what's called avodat haberurim, this, the job of sifting, sifting the good and the bad. Constantly, I'm sifting the good and the bad. And you can see that if you're looking at a very plain and literal level of the Torah, it's teaching me what's good and bad. Now, some things I can use my common sense, like not to kill. Well, for a normal person, it's common sense not to kill. But unfortunately, for a third of the world, to kill, it's a normal thing. I might even say two-thirds of the world, it's a normal thing to kill. Uh, maybe to kill human beings. Unfortunately, 90% of the world, it's fine, it's good for them to kill an animal. Maybe it's not. I don't know. This is one, one person's common sense. doesn't mean it's another person's common sense. And one person says, yeah, I think it's to totally fine to kill animals and eat them. Another person will say, no, it's cruelty. You're not allowed to do that. So even if we try to use our common sense in things, some things are very, will seem pretty obvious, like not to kill. You come to different uh, parts of the world, you tell them not to commit adultery. They'll tell you, no, I think it's totally fine. I want to have three wives. So... In some things we can use our common sense, not to steal, not to kill, not to lie. But unfortunately, that common sense doesn't always work. 
So the Torah was very specific about what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, what is good and what is not bad. The reason for that is, is because the realities are, are mixed, and it's covered by this energy, by this power that is called klipa. Klipa, again, is like a shell that covers the truth, covers the reality. And I can be deceived by the reality and by a deception. Something can deceive me. Now, some things are very easy because the Torah comes and tells me, this is permitted, this is not permitted, this is kosher, this is not kosher. When the, animal, when the Torah comes and tells me, do not eat a camel or do not eat pig, it's not because to make my diet uh, not, uh, not according to my desire. Rather, it's telling me, listen, there are things that are beyond what you understand. And everything in this world has a godly power that enlivens it. We talked about it many times in our, in our, in our uh, classes, in our interviews, that everything in the world has a certain energy, a certain power that enlivens it. This is a godly power that enlivens everything, and this including everything. Also animals have it, also inanimates have it, everything has it. We mentioned a couple of times the name of Rabbi Yitzchak Nuria Darizal. He mentions, according to his teachings of Kabbalah, that he calls it nefesh. Nefesh chaya. An energy, a godly power that enlivens everything. Now, each one of these nefesh, this godly power, is built from a completely different spiritual DNA. That when you put some of them together, it will create something good. You put some of them together, it will create an explosion. Exactly like in this world. So when the Torah comes and tells me, do not eat this specific animal, meaning because the spiritual structure of the nefesh, of the, this godly energy, of this specific animal, if I will touch it, will cause a short, short circuit with my, with my uh, soul. And will, the result will be a spiritual explosion, like you're taking uh, explosives and you're mixing things together. So the Torah is very specific. You know, and, and, there's, and each entity has a different type of nefesh and different, ty different type of energy. The, the main thing that we see that has a different type of energy is females and male. That's why, according to the Torah, a man is not allowed to touch a woman, even shake her hand. It's nothing to do necessarily with modesty. People think it's about modesty. It's nothing to, it is modesty. But spiritually, if you're looking at spiritually, the male energy is a different energy from the female. And if he touches her, there's a spiritual short circuit that causes a problem. He's only allowed to touch his wife. Why? Because it's part of his soul. So after the break, Bezat Hashem will continue by talking about why, why it's all covered and how we can actually make a, a, a see the difference and how we can pull out of it. Okay, so we're going to our second ad break. We'll be back with you. The best part of your day Good morning and welcome to the Kavana Show Body, Mind and Soul Live from Sfat and I'm sitting together with Rabbi Lon Anava and we are talking about getting out of our comfort zone and um, Alon was talking about the, the start of creation where it, it, the, that's the, the nucleus where everything starts and then expands and then when we got the Torah, the instruction that we have and the, the world that we're living in, how to kind of get out of our comfort zone from there. Yeah. Now, as I started before, everything is built from a spiritual component and from the physical component. First of all, and most important, a lot of people think that the world is just physical. The reality is the same way that our body has a soul in it. If somebody doesn't even believe in that, that's a different problem. But the truth is that we have a physical body, but in the physical body there's a spiritual soul. Same thing with the world. The world is built on a physical foundation, but there's a spiritual neshama, a spiritual soul of the world that fills in the world. Now, before I give a short explanation about the spiritual part of it, the physical part is a little bit less important because I like going always directly to the source. And in, in anything, a person can be sick. Yeah, there is a, a physical reason for the sickness, but the source is spiritual. And I, I, there's a lecture that I, that I gave, it, you can find it on my website and on YouTube, that it's called The Source of Sicknesses. It's about a four-hour lecture where I say that, yes, the, 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 every disease, every sickness that we have, it's coming from a physical place, but it, it originated in the spiritual level. 
So if I have any type of sickness, then it means that somewhere in the spiritual level there is a deficiency. Maybe my soul is sick. Maybe where I'm drawing my energy, there's a problem and I'm drawing the wrong energy, or that I'm drawing mixed energy. So it's almost like having a contaminated will, that I'm drinking water from a contaminated will. So I can draw my energy from a spiritual place, but somewhere along the way there's going to be some type of a damage in the spiritual channels that will cause my energy to be contaminated, which will affect me physically or spiritually, or emotionally. So everything originates from the spiritual, but just to touch a little bit about the physical, is that the, the, our human nature is to dwell into things that seem to us to be convenient, but they're actually not. And a lot of people tend to, to not want to move from where they are because it's familiar, not because it's good. And it can be a job. I just met not too long ago a man that is in the worst job in the world for nine years. And when I tell him, when, when he came to me with a lot of different problems, we're trying to find out where the problem is originating from, why he's depressed, why he doesn't have any energy, why he doesn't have uh, happiness, why he has problems in his marriage. So we, we summed it up and we, we, we narrowed it down that he is miserable because of his job. And he's working nine years in, in the worst place, a horrible boss, a bad job. And when I tell him, why don't you leave? He's like, no, because it's already, it's, it's, it's already my job. I want to find a new job now and get used to a new pay, a place and a new uh, uh, co-workers. And I'm already, I know what to do. It's, he's like working in a, like a robot. Yes. And I told him, because you're working in this horrible job and your boss is, is like driving you nuts, then it makes you sad, it makes you depressed. You bring the sadness and this depression home. So you start fighting with your wife and, and it's like a, a snowball that your life is a disaster because one little act that you are not willing to, to pull yourself out of it. Because why? Because you, 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 it's familiar. Because you know your path, your, your, your uh, 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 path to go to, to, to the bus route to your job. You don't want to start a different route or you don't want to meet new people. And I told him, but look at the, why, why the stubbornness. And you see that it's not good for you. You're not happy there. The pay is not so good. The boss is screaming at you. What, what, what's so hard for you to say, I don't like this place. It's not good for me. Let me go somewhere else. The thing is that, that naturally, that's how we build. It can be in a job. I gave one example of a job. It can be in a relationship. It can be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a place where you live. Not too long ago, we met a young couple that they're going through horrible things with their neighbors, lawsuits, and all day long they're driving them crazy. And when, I, and when the wife told me about the issue, I told her, why don't you just leave? Yes. Is it, isn't it easier just to rent somewhere else? I mean, you're not... Uh, uh, first of all, you don't own the place. If you would own the place, I would say, okay, that's a whole different thing. But you're renting an apartment, and you have issues all day long with your neighbors, the dog is barking, this is doing... The, the kids are doing damages. Just get up and leave. So why do you want to keep on having a headache? Okay, something you, you're in a certain position, a certain place in this world, and it's not, not working out, get up and leave. The unfortunate reality is that people get into this comfort zone. It doesn't have to be spiritual. It can be a very physical thing. And they, it's just familiar to them, and they don't want to leave because I think it's just laziness. And again, I give an example with a home, and I give an example with a job. It's, it's, it's relationships. It's everything. It's every little thing, even f habits. I don't believe that there's such a thing as a habit. I mean, there is, but it's just a very bad way to define it by saying it's a habit. It's not a habit. It's just a very uh, uh, low power of, of be able to deal with situations. If a person says, oh, I'm doing it because it's a habit. No, you know, ha animals have habits. Because that's their nature. I don't like words, using the word habit. That's why I said it's a wrong way of defining it. It's nature. We are, we are created with a certain nature. A cow's nature is to eat all day long and then to sleep. And then to eat and then to sleep and then to eat and then to sleep. That's it's a cow's nature. A tiger, his nature is to hunt. When a tiger is hunting a deer, it's not because a tiger is mean. He's a nice animal. That's his nature is to be aggressive and to hunt. So everything has a certain nature to it. So we also have a certain nature to us, and by me abusing it, 
or, or, or taking it to a level that I'm not able to deal with something, and I can call it, blame it as a habit, it's not a habit. It's just I don't want to deal with the situation. So I'm calling it a habit. So the reality is that our, 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 our spiritual, our, our natural component is, is to be inclined to the situation that I don't want to leave my comfort zone because it's familiar and I don't want to start something new because the starting is always hard. It's, it, whether it's a new job, whether it's a new relationship, doesn't matter what it is, and starts are always hard. And whereas human beings are looking for an easy life, we're not looking for a hard life. So whatever requires a lot of effort, that goes under the definition of hard, then I don't want to do it. Very few people are very energetic and go-getters, and they're like, I want the challenge. I want something new. Most people say, no, you know, I've been in this relationship for 10 years. I'm, I'm really used to all the, the problems. Why start now a new relationship and, and, uh, and deal with something new? Now, I'm not saying that when everything is going bad, get up and leave. That's not the solution. That's not what I'm saying. Because sometimes, yes, so you don't have a good job, but it doesn't mean you just get up and leave, or, or a relationship. Don't take my words out of context, because a lot of people, they <laughs> say, take something that I say and say, oh, Alon said that everything, something bad happens just to get up and leave. It has to be done in a very re rational and reasonable way. You don't just leave situations. On the contrary, you have, to, you have to battle situations. I'm just giving an example that a lot of people, they tend to dwell and to sink into a certain situation, like quicksand, and they don't want to leave it. Obviously, like I said before, everything starts from the spiritual place. And if something in the spiritual level is stuck, then it will manifest into the physical level, and I will be stuck somewhere in the physical level. And I mentioned before that this concept of klipa. Klipa is a negative energy. Everything, there was many types of energies in this world. There's good energies, bad energies. And I create energies. If I will, create, if I will do something positive, I create a positive energy. Like a wave. If I will now drop a stone into, a, uh, into the water, it will create like this ripple effect, like a ring that will go bigger and bigger and bigger, and for whatever reason, it will create more rings. Why? Because my act has a certain uh, uh, continuation. So one might say, okay, it's a certain energy that it will, it's continuing to, to roll. It's almost like taking a ball and, and rolling it. How come it rolls for 100 meters and then it stops? It has a certain energy that it goes 100 meters from the, from the force that I pushed it, and at some point it will go slower and slower and slower and then stop. So the same example that I can kick a ball and in the first 10 meters it goes the fastest and then slowly, slowly stops. Every act that I do, it's like I'm throwing something out to the world. In the beginning it will be powerful, and then slowly, slowly it will stop, it slow down and then stop. So when I do something positive, I help a person, I talk honest, I don't curse, or I do positive actions, then I, the energy that is created from that is positive. When I do something negative, then the energy is negative. That's why a lot of people, they don't understand. They, something bad happens into, in their life, and right away they say, God is punishing me. I did this, so God is punish me, punishing me because I did that. It's the worst way to analyze the master of the universe, because God doesn't punish anyone. People think that God is standing in the heavens with a baseball bat and a bunch of angels and you do something wrong and then you get hit on your head. And, and this is a very, very wrong way of looking, of, 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 at, looking at, at, at Hashem, at God, or analyzing Judaism or any type of religion. Because the reality is that God doesn't punish anyone. You do an action and right away you bring on yourself a reaction. And that's it. And God stands on the side, and sometimes he laughs, and sometimes he cries. <laughs> but if you go and bang your head at the wall, you'll get a headache. You cannot complain to the wall, and you cannot complain to your head, and you cannot complain to anyone. You did an action that is negative. Now deal with the reaction. So nobody's punishing anyone. So the reality is that I do a certain, a certain act, and I will throw a certain energy into the universe, and that energy will come back to me. So... These energies are sometimes covered and hidden by this power that is called klipa. And in a very short explanation is that we see at the time when the Jews were in Egypt, in Mitzrayim, people think that they're in Egypt south of Israel. That's the, the literal part of the story, that they're in, this, in a country called Egypt. 
But the word Egypt in, Mitzra, in, in Hebrew is called Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim comes from the word Meitzar. Meitzar is a limitation. Something that limits you. Our sages say, Bechol dor vador, chayav adam lirot atzmo kilu hu yatsa v'mitzrayim. Every generation, a person needs to see himself like as if he came out of Egypt. So comes a very special rabbi, Rabbi Shniyor Zalman from Liadi, who is known as the older rabbi, who is known also as the Baal Atanya. And he says, Bechol yom vayom chayav adam lirot atzmo. Every day, a person has to see himself like as if he left Egypt. Now, leaving Egypt is not leaving the country Egypt, rather living my state of limitation because I'm constantly limited by things spiritual physical and emotional things would limit me and if I don't go out of my limitation I'm stuck in my Egypt wow. so I am a slave to the reality where I am and every day I have to go out of my limitation I have to reach out and leave my time now what was so hard for them 3,000 years ago or 3,300 years ago to be more precise, what was so hard for them to leave Egypt? Okay, so the literal level explains to us there was a big army, and there was guards, and they couldn't leave, and whoever would try to leave will get shot down, and so forth. The reality is, that this is this is what spiritually happened, this is what the book of the Zohar explains, that there was a certain type of klipot, certain types of these energies, and Paro, who we know him as Pharaoh, he was a, a, a very powerful individual. He's, he was a sorcerer. He wasn't some, some regular man. That's why they were able at the time, there was a lot of sorcery and black magic at the time. That's why they were able to duplicate the, the plagues in the beginning. So Moses came and threw his staff and he became a snake. They were able to do the exact same thing. Moses was able to make the, uh, the water turn into blood. They were able to do the same thing. Only when they got to the plague of lice, of kinim, then they said, that's Belokim. They could not do that because it was, weight, it was a little bit, it was too small for them to duplicate. But Pharaoh was a very powerful individual and he was able to, to put spells and to, to create these energies. So there was a certain energy, a certain klipa at the time that was called Kelev. Kelev is a dog. Yes. But Kelev comes from the word Kulo Lev. It's all heart meaning that it's just desired only physical pleasures. Now this powerful klipa, when, you know, our sages say that a slave was not able to leave Mitzrayim. Now when you think about it, how did they do it? Now in our days, there's a surveillance and sophisticated walls and fences and, and drones and cameras and you can kind of uh, guard a border. And how did they do it 3,000 years ago? They did it because they had control with this klipa of the slaves' minds. And when the slave will come to the border, this klipa that would manifest in the level of thought would convince the slave to go back to Mitzrayim. Wow. Will convince the person, why do you have to run out to the desert? Back home, your family's there, your job is there, even though you hate it. And you're a slave, but it's okay because you have food and you're in a, in a, everything is, is, is uh, familiar to you. Well, are you going to now go to a new place that you've never seen? A desert that is all empty and you're not going to be next to your family? And this energy would convince the person, that the, the, the slave, to go back. Mm -hmm. And that's how they kept the slaves from running out, by controlling their thoughts at the time, it's hard to picture, but that's the, that's the mystical explanation that Paro was controlling the slaves' thoughts. And that's how they were controlling them not to leave their comfort zone, because they were in Egypt. They were stuck in the state of limitation. So, you know, the Torah comes and tells us a story, but you have to really dissect the story and remove the cover and see what's the, the, the depth in it. The depth in it that they were stuck in a comfort zone. In a spiritual power that was controlling their thoughts. Fast forward now 3,300 years, we are in the exact same place. We are. We are stuck in Egypt, in Mitzrayim. Egypt is not the right way to say it. We say it in Hebrew, Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is a state of limitation. And my thoughts are being controlled. And they're being controlled by this klipa, by this negative energy that in most cases I created. But there's something even more bigger than that, that our generation is controlled by thoughts. We know that there, there are three wars, three big wars that have to happen before the coming of Mashiach. They're called Gog and Magog. 
If two of them already happened, World War One and World War Two. The war, the war, the war. First of all, is a spiritual war. Unfortunately, the first two, two ones, they it manifested into a physical, into the physical world. So we had an actual w- physical war of it. Now Moshiach is coming very soon. We are already in the third war. Yes. The Zohar calls it Milchemet Gigim. Milchemet Gigim is a war of thoughts. So we already started the, the, the war. Now, yeah, you might see in the physical level that countries are fighting with each other, and it looks like any second it can erupt to World War Three. But this war already started a long time ago, and this is the war of thoughts, and this is this Gog Magog before the coming of Mashiach, and the war of thoughts, I call it the war of screens, because 99% of humankind is, is hypnotized by a screen. And 60-70% of our day, when we're awake, of course, we are glued to a screen, and it beeps, and I jump on the screen, and it makes a noise, and I jump on it. And it can be my phone, it can be my tablet, it can be my, 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 my computer. We are attached to screens. And 80% of the time that I'm attached to that screen is nonsense. I'm not utilizing my time. If I go online to shop, to check my bank account, to communicate, to do positive things, that's good. But that's 10% of the time. 90% of the time is junk. It's nonsense. And I'm wasting my time. And I'm basically being controlled by the screens. I might be looking at an article on a website, but 60% of, the, of what I'm not looking at is being registered in my subconscious. All the ads, all the banners that are popping up and down. You go on a social network, you go on Facebook, yeah, so you, you concentrate on the center maybe, on the posts, but around you there's bad, banners and ads and things are flicking and, and flashing. And we don't realize that all these things are going into my subconscious. And, and I'm hypnotized by the screen. Yes, it's a hyp- like a hypnosis. Yeah, so we are, all, uh, we are all slaves to the screens. And these screens are controlling our thoughts. That You see, you put a child now in front of a screen all day long, the child becomes violent and curses. And, 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 and of course, they're blaming it on many other things. ADD, HD, HD. No, you're feeding the child junk from a screen because you don't want to deal with the child. It's much easier to put a child in front of a box for three hours and to play with him than you feed the child that, that nonsense and then the child is, is behaving accordingly. So I know we have to go into another break, but we'll continue later that how finally, now that we've figured out why am I stuck in this uh, reality, how am I getting out of it? Okay, so we're going to our third, bre- third break and we'll be back now. Good morning and welcome to the Kavana Show, Body, Mind and Soul. And we are live from Swat on Rosh Chodesh. I'm sitting next to Rabbi Alon Anava. And it is uh, we, we, it's just, it, just amazing to, to be here in Swat. Um, and to... We're speaking about getting out of our comfort zone, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I know um, you know a lot of uh, Alon's journey to actually getting to Sfat was getting out of a lot of comfort zones, and my journey as well, also getting out of so many, so many comfort zones. So it is possible, and um, so you gave us the background, and now you're going to share with us how people can actually do that. How do we? take the next step. Yeah, the, first of all, and most important to understand that we're all stuck in a comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And if you think you're not, then you're living in denial. If you're now looking at the screen and saying, this guy this does not, doesn't know what he's talking about, I mean, it's fine, you can say that. But that's just a sign how deep you are stuck in your comfort zone. Now, the comfort zone, again, one might interpret it as a negative thing. One might just interpret it of a situation. The, the, the topic is so broad and so hard to cover in one hour. It's extremely important that you don't take every word and take it out of context and saying, oh, this is happening because of that, that is happening because of this. This is just being OCD about, about nonsense. A person needs to really know how to analyze situations, especially when it comes to the world of Torah, the world of Judaism, that are the first thing that the Torah tells us to do is appoint yourself a rabbi. A rabbi doesn't necessarily need to have a black hat and a, and a black beard. A rabbi means a teacher. 
somebody who inspires you and somebody that 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 is able to 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 help you and to guide you and to teach you and you can be the, the best doctor in the world but the best doctor in the world also needs a guide and also needs a mentor and you can be the best businessman in the world the best anything in the world also needs a mentor a guide and that's when the Torah says, make yourself a rabbi. Again, people confuse it and they say, oh, a rabbi means he has to have a black suit and, and sit in the synagogue all day long and I'm going to ask him questions in, in halakha, in the oral law. No, a rabbi is a teacher and it can be a, 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 the same gender you are. You don't have to necessarily go to the other gender if you feel less comfortable. But the concept is that I have to have a guide. I like calling it a personal trainer. Because if I'm gonna, if I if I want to do something, I need somebody to to make me do it, somebody to inspire me, somebody to guide me. That's why I started off by saying that our sages say that a prisoner cannot release himself from his own cell. So if I want to be now world class championship in boxing, I need a personal trainer. It doesn't matter how how strong I am. Yes. And if I want to be now anything that you're thinking that you want to be, you need somebody to guide you. And you need somebody to teach you, and most importantly, you need somebody to inspire you. Because if you don't have inspiration coming from somewhere, you will not move an inch. So the, 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 the first step was one needs to appoint himself a, a, a source of inspiration. Spiritually, there's no doubt that if I'm stuck in a place that I'm spiritually I'm not moving, the first problem is that I don't have a mentor. I don't have somebody who's inspiring. I don't have a rabbi or a rebbetzin or a friend that spiritually can inspire me by telling me, come, join me to this class. Come and join me to pray now. Come to my Shabbat table. Because we are prisoners. And the reality is, it doesn't matter who we are, we can be very successful in one place. I can be extremely successful in business, but I'll have very, very hard problems in my family life or my relationship with one of my kids. All the other kids are good, but one of them I can't find a, a bridge to, to communicate. And in essence, if you, if you really remove your ego, because ego, our ego is the, is the biggest problem. Any obstacle that, that comes my way is only because of my ego. Because my ego will tell me, oh, no, 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 I have no problems. Oh, no, everything is under control. It's their problem. It's her, it's her issues. She's the problem, not me. The first thing you have to do is to remove your ego out of the, out of the, the, the entire area. Because our ego is our, it will stop us from doing everything. And when you remove your ego by diminishing yourself and saying, um, I might be great in this department, but I'm very not great in that department. And I, I'm, not a, I'm not the best husband. I'm not the best employee. I'm not the best employer. I'm not uh, such a good friend because this person, I, didn't, I wasn't really honest with them. The first and most important thing is that I have to be very honest with myself. And the first thing I need to do is to remove my ego. And when I remove my ego, I can start doing my first analysis. Where am I failing and what am I doing wrong? Because if I have my ego in the meeting, my ego will tell me, you're not doing anything wrong. It's the other person that is doing wrong. You are 100% perfect and everybody around you are wrong. So we, you remove the ego and you say, no, I'm actually, I am wrong. I'm not the best husband or the best wife or I'm a very not nice in, a, a worker or neighbor. And when I remove my ego, I can make a real true analysis by seeing where am I lacking? Where am I stuck? Where am I stuck in my life? Am I stuck in my, my, my social skills? Am I stuck in my, in, in my career? Am I stuck in my relationship? I'm stuck somewhere. So comfort zone is also being stuck somewhere. Now, when I make this true analysis of saying, okay, let me remove my ego. Let me see where I'm bad, where I'm not so good. And then I turn to my, to my inspiration, to my guide, and I tell that person, I have problems with controlling my anger. I have problems with controlling my eating habits. I have problems in controlling anything that I have problems with. Then the, the source of inspiration, the rabbi, the rabbits, and the whatever it is, is able to tell you, oh, okay, so for this thing, let's do that. Because there's no black and white. You cannot answer in a, in, a, in a show or in an interview, if this is a problem, do A, B, and C, and add a cup of sugar, and everything will be okay. Yes. Because every individual is completely, completely different. My eating disorder is different from your eating disorder. 
I will overindulge over something physical because of depression, and a certain person will overindulge on something physical because of a completely different thing. It's nothing to do with depression or anything. It could be a, 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 a source of emptiness in their life because they lost somebody or a relationship. So unfortunately, there's no black and white. Why did I say that we got the Torah and everything is in it? Because all the answers of our problems is in the Torah. So after I made my first analysis of saying I'm not that great, and then I go to my source of inspiration, which usually should be a, 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 a source of inspiration that is coming from the world of Torah. Not too long ago, somebody was talking to me, and 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 she calls me once a month. You know, we talk about the different things, and then she says, "I found my mentor." And, oh, unbelievable man, and this and that. I was like, great, I'm very happy that you found your source of inspiration. And, and when, when I was going into all sorts of questions, one of the questions was, I don't remember, we were, was something like, where does he pray, or something like that. And she was like, oh, no, he's not Jewish. And, oh, I, was, and wow. I was like, you, are, you found a spiritual mentor. You're Jewish, oh, you're religious. Okay. And you found a spiritual mentor that is not Jewish? I don't understand. Yes. Like, if you would tell me that your business or your career mentor is not Jewish, that's totally fine. He's teaching you your trade. But, but in your, your spiritual work of serving God, you're finding somebody who is not Jewish? I don't understand. He can be the best person in the world, the most widest man ever, but he's not Jewish. He doesn't even know anything about Judaism. How can he inspire you in Judaism? So the point is that, yes, you want your source of inspiration to be somebody who's coming from the world of the Torah that can quote the Torah. The Torah is very difficult. You know, the, the book is very thick, and when you open the book, all you run into is, is stories. Yes. You know, and you don't need any, 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 any lessons, just stories. So you need somebody to explain to you the book. But in the Torah is all the answers. In the Torah, every little problem that we have, the Torah will have the solution to it. So I have to make a very quick analysis, and this is a very, very basic way of how am I getting out of my comfort zone. I mean, you should definitely follow it, but it's much more to it. As far as you have to make a, a real honest analysis of yourself, and you have to move your, completely remove your ego. And if you're now looking at the screen again, or, or you're driving in your car and you're listening and you're saying, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, I don't have any ego, then <laughs> that, that just means you have an ego. The reality is that we all have an ego. So first of all, you kick him out of the door. Then you bring your source of inspiration, your rabbi, your rebbitzin, your, 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 your instructor, however you want to call that individual. And then you turn to the Torah, because everything is in the Torah. And when I say turn to the Torah, it means that you follow what the Torah tells you. Is that you learn what the Torah is teaching us to do, what not to do, what it, what it should do. Of course, it's much more to it, but this is the general idea. Bezalel Hashem, after the the break, I'll tell you one more thing that can help you to get out of your comfort zone, and hopefully. Okay, so we're going to our last break, and we'll be, we'll we'll be back with you now. Fresh thinking every Thursday from two to three p.m. 101.9 high FM, 101.9 megahertz of power. A frequency like no other. 101.9 high FM. Good morning and welcome to the Kavana Show, Body, Mind and Soul. And with this morning we live from Svat, Rosh Chodesh, and um, sitting together with Rabbi Alon Anava, and we've been talking about getting out of one's comfort zone. And um, Alon has really shared some absolute gems, some diamonds, in terms of various steps that you can take. And just in wrapping up the show, you were going to share a couple, maybe one or two last diamonds. I was just about to say something that, that many people might not see eye to eye, but we know that the entire world is called, in the, in the Kabbalistic term, Olam Asiyah, the world of doing. That's coming from the four spiritual worlds, that the lowest one is called Olam Asiyah. But we also know from the teachings of Kabbalah that the land of Israel is not from Olam HaAsiyah, rather from Olam HaYetzirah, from a much higher spiritual place. And, you know, Baruch Hashem, I have the schut of guiding and helping a lot of people during their Aliyah. And not too long ago, a certain individual made Aliyah, and he told me that he's going through a very hard time and to adjusting. 
I told him, listen, listen, it's like emerging into a highway. Everybody's <laughs> driving 120, 140, and you're just accelerating. Besides, that the energy in Israel is a total different energy, and you coming from the United States, and I told him, just, just physical. In the United States, the electricity in the world runs on 110 volts. Here in Israel, the electricity is running on 220 volts. I don't know how it is in, in South Africa, but even the voltage in Israel is much more powerful. Much more powerful. And I told that individual, Israel is, is running on a totally different frequency because it's a much more spiritual, much more holy place. And, and the reality is that Israel, by default, has much less of these klipot. So one of the solutions to getting out of your comfort zone is just to come to Eretz Israel because the energy in Israel is totally, totally different. The energy outside of Israel is a much more heavier energy and it pulls you more down, whether you want to agree with it or not, or whether you can see it or not. A lot of people say, ah, Israel is so hard there, and everything is hard here. Nothing is hard here. Yeah, I find that everything is easier here than in any other countries. I'm not saying it's an easy place to live. Yeah, we have some excruciating hard, uh, 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 hot weather here sometimes, or the people might sometimes be a little bit edgy, and, and some other things. But the reality is that spiritually, uh, the energy in Israel is totally, totally different. It's a much lighter energy. If you really tap into the energy, yes. it actually elevates you. So by default, it takes you out of this klipa, out of this dirt, and you elevate it to a much higher level that it's much easier for you to deal with your habits and your nature and all these things that you're stuck in. Yes. So I know this is a catch-22 because getting out of my comfort <laughs> zone where I am in the world, that's a problem to start with. <laughs> So that's the problem with most people, that to get them to do Aliyah is that they're in their comfort zone. Because I have a job, and I have a house, and I have everything here, I've been living here for 40, 50 years, and that's the ultimate getting out of my comfort zone. But when I want to get out of my, I have so many different comfort zones in my life, <laughs> but one of the things that helps me get out of it is to come to Eretz Israel. And Eretz Israel is because the energy is completely different, it it's elevates me. That's why we say when we come to Eretz Israel, we do Aliyah. Aliyah means to ascend, to go higher. And you know, if you're coming from South Africa, it's not Aliyah. Uh, yeah, sorry, if you're coming from Russia or Europe, it's not Aliyah. It's, it's, if you're looking at it by the, by the directions of the globe, it's coming down. It's Yerida. Mm -hmm. But you're going up in a level, so that's why the Aliyah is. And that's the ultimate going out of your comfort zone. And even if you can't right now where you are to do right away Aliyah, which you should, then you at least have to make where you are in Eretz Israel a holy place and, 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 a, and, a, and a, a different place and an elevated place, which means your entire uh, spiritual life should be surrounded with the energy of Eretz Israel, which is a holy energy. Tap into the holiness of the Torah. Elevate yourself. Make, become much more closer to God. Well, as long as you're working where you are to climb to a higher level spiritually, you reach a certain level of Eretz Israel, and that by default will allow you to leave your comfort zone. Yes. So, Alon, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for the, the, those absolutely wonderful words of wisdom. And Baruch Hashem, um, just that uh, you and your family go from strength to strength. Amen. The, the amount of uh, incredible work that you're doing is just amazing. And please, listeners, um, visit Alon's website, see his story, email him, alonanover at gmail.com. And uh, so I don't have much more to say. And just thank you so much for listening, my beloved listeners. Live from Svat on Rosh Chodesh. Enjoy the Rosh Chodesh, enjoy the halal, the beauty of uh, two days of Rosh Chodesh, especially the ladies and have the best Wednesday, the best rest of your week, and the most beautiful, beautiful Shabbos. From Kavana, Baba. We bring the news.